50 ton of water. And, uh, and uh, for a trip like this, we'll probably go through about 150 ton of water and a little bit less of fuel. Where are your ship service generators? The service generators are, are just below, just forward of the uh, main engine. Forward of the main This is uh, and you saw the shafts coming out there, and then that would be re reduction gear to uh, this only spin at 150. Well, we had a German lesson today that uh, was beyond just the alphabet. It was quite nice, little switch and routine, and we'll do that again tomorrow. I'll give you an update on the Russian lesson. Did I say German? I meant Russian. Da, Pozalista, Spasiva and those kind of things. I'll talk to you later. I don't know if I got a view of the cabin before. Here's what the cabin looks like. Looking out into the hallway area. And here's a little desk writing area. Well, we just had an announcement for our first iceberg sighting. I've come outside. We're about to see an iceberg on the horizon. It's 8 o'clock on Friday morning, I believe. Our fourth day of sailing. We're now in the Southern Sea. I'll try to catch these announcements over the speaker system next time just to give you a feeling of what the that system is like. Well this is the view that I've got without the, the telephoto lens on the horizon. I'll zoom in and zoom back. And just give you a feeling of, of here's the ship. That's the first indication we're in the Antarctic. Well, there it is again. It's uh, about 15, 20 minutes later from the previous time I took it. So moving down. Here's the back of the ship to give you a relationship with the Not sure if they're out there. I'll just I'll do a scan here. All we need to do is get there and we're ready to go see the icebergs and the, the flora and the fauna. There's mine right in the middle, that Mariner 40. This is a view of the lifeboats from above. I'm on the fifth deck now, 
lifeboat's on the fourth deck. No, that's wrong. I'm on the sixth deck, flying bridge. That's the fifth deck where the uh, fire drill takes place. I'm going to get my microphone out now, too. This is the other lifeboat from uh, the other side. This is the port side. It's the main hatch right there. Got to squeeze in there. It's a tight fit, watertight boat. There's also this rescue boat. drops in if there's somebody overboard or there's a problem with the Zodiac landings, they, this probably follows us around. There's also a sailboat right in front of the uh, lifeboat. Can't see that very well from this position. Academic Yofe from Kaliningrad. There's some of the hooks and the, the grappling mechanisms that keep it taunt here. And here's one of the few signs in English, the only one I've seen here for launching the lifeboat, for getting the uh, it ready for embarkation or disembarkation. And the mic turned off just then. I'm testing out this telephoto microphone. I didn't have it on. Humpback whale alert. But you'll notice the wind on this one is actually <coughs> blowing this way. And it's a hefty wind this day. And they're all kind of, you notice how they start to orient this way with their butts to the wind. Well, if they're broadsiding, you lose heat through convection, wind convection off your body. So they're actually orienting to Delhi. So just to kind of give you a real feel of how different they are in sizes. But all penguins, and a lot of other animals as well, have what we call disruptive coloring, being dark on top and light underneath. There's an advantage to that as a predator and as a prey species. If you are looking at this animal in the water and you're above the water, it's got a dark back and the water appears dark, so it's not as easy to see. If you're a krill looking up, you see white sea because the sun and the clouds are up there. What do you see? you see the whiter underside, so they're not as easy to see. You notice that the blue-eyed shag had this same disruption. A little slit up them, literally, of their feathers that comes apart and they incubate their egg on actual skin against their body, not in feathers. So it's literally, it's actually called a brood patch, 
and it opens up and they slit in and then they have feathers that kind of come around. So it actually keeps them very, very warm. It's very nice. But the primary predator against the chicks and eggs of these, like we said yesterday, are the south polar skuas, the brown skuas, and the live. It's actually dead by now, but at the time they started it was alive. They knock them down, they pull through the haunches here, start yanking the guts out and eating it alive. I've actually seen where these have been startled off, and the little penguin will get up and start walking away, dragging his guts behind him. Eventually they generally do die, but penguins is a penguin. If you see this in action, it is when they, am I blocking your view very badly? You can move if I am. The head showing and a bit of the butt usually. So I'm going to focus a little bit now talking about what the brush tail penguins do. These Adelie penguins, they feed predominantly on krill. They go out for long, long forays. When they go out to forage, they go all the way out sometimes 70, 80 miles away. They've been satellite tracked. So they go very, very far away. Now all three of these are a little later. Now because they're breeding... So that's what the kings and the emperors do. You don't really see that in the Adelis and these other These birds are making their nests. Once again, this is in the South Shetland Islands, Adelie penguins. They're making their nests out of pebbles. So they're shallow depressions and they're, and they're made together with pebbles. The reason we think that they use pebbles, or one of the advantages to using pebbles, is that they tend to have snow melt because they're nesting before the snow's already melted, so you get muddy water. By having your eggs up on a pebbled ground, you're keeping your eggs out of the cold, muddy, yucky water. So it's an advantageous thing for them. They tend to nest, as you can see, there's nests throughout this very rocky, kind of off area. So their density really depends on the availability of Uh, this is just a pretty one to show you what the emperors look like. We did, in fact, see an emperor last year on King George. That is an unusual vagrant sighting, so I wouldn't expect to see an emperor down here. Post-breeding. Well, this makes a lot of sense because when they molt, they no longer have that insulation and they're no longer waterproof. So you have to stay on shore. So you can't do very well doing it when you need to be going out and getting food for your young. The Adelis, they molt in the pack ice, whereas the chin straps, the macaronis, and the gentoos actually molt on shore. You'll see the very, very light gray. The Adelis young are darker gray, getting darker as they get older, and the gentoos look pretty much just like little gentoos as young. This here shows you the Adelis as the call out and then they'll kind of run away from this group a little bit. The way they want to know for sure that they're only feeding their own chick is that their chick will recognize the call and chase after them. Well as they get larger and larger groups together they'll make them chase them longer and longer because that affects their food supply as well. But they're also affected by things like global warming which are not natural causes and they're also affected really heavily by pollution. mom's turned her head. It's, it's like kids in a store. How come this kid gets kidnapped? Because mom turned her head for one second and the kid's gone. It's the same with the penguins. It really is. They're predators out there. Um, well, anyway, uh, it just doesn't seem very likely. So, if that years, <laughs> or a little less, say 275 million years to about 175 million years ago. And uh, this was just before Gondwana land broke up, and it was just after the great continent of Pangaea formed from one pole to another. And uh, 
This is the average temperatures as predicted by one of several different models. Now, Orbital changes, you know, the 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 uh, hundred thousand year uh, uh, changes, so that the glaciers, as they accumulate, the sea level lowers. As the glaciers melt, the sea level rises, and the and the water comes in and out. And that's how you get the great coal deposits in in North America. It migrated uh, down here at 265 million years, still in Antarctica, and then up to eastern Australia not far from Antarctica at 245 million years and then 175 million years it's out in the ocean and uh, things start warming up actually as we get into slightly lower a ice house world here a gradual warming quite warm in the Mesozoic and the whole time we're in the Antarctic Circle and of course the models just can't explain that now, the way I did this was to put a series of maps, and this is uh, Gondwana land with Antarctica here in the center. Here's the South Pole right here. It shows you the distribution of things. And we have, these are the distributions of glacial deposits that we found in Antarctica. Now, Eastern Australia, Western Australia, all through Southern Africa, goes right into South America and India glacial deposits. And uh, we even know the directions in which those glaciers went. Some, most of them went away from Antarctica, but some are going the wrong way. And uh, these are just local things. And a close-up again of these glacial deposits. And uh, you can see these up in Ontario of a much older age. Or you can see the soft equivalent in your backyard if you live in the, in the Middle West. And